and welcome to Perspectives. My name is Dan McGraw. Today's guest is Kathleen O'Connor Ives, who is currently the state senator for First Essex here in Massachusetts. Um, we've invited other guests, uh, Jessica Finacaro, who showed an interest but um, did not confirm a time, and Sean Tui was also in, uh, invited. Uh, but uh, did not respond to the invitation. So I'm very happy that Kathleen was able to join us. Um, so maybe we sh uh, should just start with talking a little bit about yourself, what your credentials are. You've got experience now a couple of years. You, you swept it uh, two years ago. We were here talking and it was a question of, it was a pretty close race and I thought there was, I thought you had some good competition in terms of p people's ideas who are similar to your own ideas. Uh, Tim Coco, for instance, who comes to mind as somebody that. Um, so um, um, what's your experience been like in mm -hmm. uh, these uh, over these last couple of years? And It's been fascinating. Yeah, I, I appreciate being on the show because the last time I was here, I was a candidate yes, for State were. Senate in 2012. Yeah. yeah. Uh, prior to that, I served on the Newburyport City Council that's right, that's as a right. councillor at large for mm -hmm. five years. Mm -hmm. And that was great experience that I thought was really relevant to the job of state senator mm -hmm. because there are 40 state senators in Massachusetts. Okay. I serve as one. Okay. And for me, it's the work of a really large city council in that mm -hmm. dynamic where it has to be collaborative. Mm -hmm. And you work on state legislation versus city ordinances. Mm -hmm but it's similar also in the way that you still do constituent services mm -hmm. and instead of working on a municipal budget you're working on a state budget okay. and it was a very hmm. very long campaign last time around with both a, a primary and a general mm -hmm. but I'm very honored to be doing this work Good. and here we are Good. back at it with mm -hmm. another primary election on September 9th and mm -hmm. then the general election is on November 4th right. and over this year and a half, um, it's a two-year term, over this year and a half I've worked on two state budgets mm -hmm. and have made a lot of progress on the legislative front as well. Mm -hmm. And I've made an effort to work with all of the people in the seven cities and towns that make up our district because you have to build lines of communication with mm -hmm. the boards of selectmen, the school committees, the town managers, mayors, residents, businesses. There's a lot of people that you should be working with if you're going to adequately represent everyone. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, a district, a state senate district, does that go by county? So it actually is, uh, is by region. So we have these regions where our state senate district, the first Essex, mm -hmm. predominantly is north of the Merrimack River. Mm -hmm. So the communities include Amesbury, Salisbury, Newburyport, mm -hmm. Merrimack, all of Haverhill, all of Methuen and North Andover. Newburyport is south of the river, but the Merrimack River is really that thing that, that ties the whole region together. Mm -hmm. So um, typically you'll have senators who are covering regions like the southeast, the Cape, the Berkshires mm -hmm. that have a mm -hmm. geographic affinity. Mm -hmm. And each of us is charged with representing over 160,000 people. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Wow. So. Like in the Constitution it says that the congressional rep is, is limited to 30,000 people and now it's 700,000 people. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too where you have at the federal level a U.S. senator that has a term of six years and the state senator has a term of two years and truly it's a year and a half because by a year and a half in you already have to collect signatures again to mm. get back on the ballot and, mm. and gear up for that campaign mode. Mm -hmm. So both uh, state reps and state senators have two-year terms. Yeah, yeah. Why isn't it divided up by county? Um, it's interesting where the 14 counties that we have, you know, very, very large in terms of um, geographical yeah. um, coverage, you know, because we have the population dividing yeah. it up, you'll have some of the senators in the more urban areas have a very small geographic area. Okay. And then some of the senators where the population is more spread out okay. could have 30 or 40 towns that they represent. Wow. Um, which is really challenging. Wow. Um, if it were divided at the county level, it would be even a, a greater swath to wow. represent. So wow. um, for me, I feel like um, the, the 
the division <coughs> of ours. There's, there's plenty of affinity, plenty of common ground, but mm -hmm. there has to be a balance between every municipality that I represent is mm -hmm. unique on its own accord. Mm -hmm. It has its own priorities, oh, yeah. its own goals, oh, its yeah. own uniqueness. Oh, yeah. And then we're also responsible for working on issues that are statewide as well. So. Oh my goodness, I mean, just some, some cities block to block, it's a completely different culture. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and, yeah. um, and I appreciate that. Yeah. I chair the tourism committee in the legislature. I'm the Senate chair, okay. and, um, <laughs> and I appreciate whether it's um, historical preservation uh -huh. or the natural resources that are in our area, mm -hmm. the farms that are in our Senate mm -hmm. district. Mm -hmm. There is great diversity that we want to highlight. I wouldn't want every city in town um, to be the same. Mm -hmm. And I think that the Merrimack Valley is on the right track to become a tourist destination. That's part of my work too. Mm -hmm. I sit on five different committees in the legislature, one of which is to chair the tourism committee. And I'm also the vice chair of the small business committee. And then I'm rank and file on the higher education committee. Oh, that's interesting. Financial services committee mm -hmm. and consumer protection. Wow. Wow. Interesting job, huh? It is. There isn't really a book on how to do this. Right. You um, get the opportunity to do it on your own terms as much as possible Good. to a certain extent. Good. But then there's Good. also the, um, the process and procedure that comes with working in a legislative body. Which is, must be interesting to learn. It is. Yeah. It is. It's, it's different from uh, some of the Roberts rules and um, protocol right. in, in the city council where I came from. Right. But I will tell you that the experience has been really positive in terms of being a freshman legislator I, I coming in. I believe that. I believe that. Yeah. There's a tradition in the Senate that I didn't know about as a new <laughs> senator that I found out once I got there, which is uh -oh. a senator does not speak on the Senate floor until they do their first maiden speech. And it has to be about an issue that you care deeply about. Oh, and when you conclude your speech, everyone stands up and applauds regardless, which is kind of nice. Yeah, it is nice. So yeah. uh -huh. I chose my topic carefully. And um, I, I did the speech during my first state budget. Okay. I spoke to the lack of funding in Massachusetts for municipal police training. I did not realize until mm. I got into the legislature that Massachusetts, and you'd be surprised to learn too, Massachusetts is at the very bottom of the 50 states for how much money they apply toward continuing education for our local police officers. Wow, that is surprising. It was surprising to me yeah. too. Um, and it's really important because as they're contending with things like search and seizure or how to respond to uh, particular events that happen, um, their burden with having to follow the law. They need to follow the law. But right. where does that continued training come from? Right. So that they can comply with everything from <coughs> how to use pepper spray to all of these um, nuanced issues that they're responsible for. Mm -hmm. And like the Fourth Amendment, for instance. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, I, I um, should say what the Fourth Amendment is. It's illegal search and seizure. That's right. right. Yeah. And um, there has to be due cause. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, and those have been. I'm sorry, I keep oh, no, interrupting. Of but uh, those have been really up for grabs since the Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. A lot has changed since then. The with, issue uh, of, with the Fourth Amendment. The issue of warrants. Um, there, there are many, many nuanced issues, and it's unfair. Mm -hmm. without continued training and curriculum to, um, mm -hmm. to continue with that. So mm -hmm. I waited for the budget to come around mm -hmm. and asked for increased funding. And it was great. We got an anonymous vote from the Senate to have increased funding for municipal police training. Mm -hmm. And what that did truly mm -hmm. was that was the fiscal year 2014 budget. Mm -hmm. by, the, by the 15 budget, FY15, mm -hmm. it completely changed the direction of the funding. So now the funding is going in an upward trajectory to mm -hmm. say, you know, we can't be using curriculum from the 1990s. Mm -hmm. We can't tell people that even though they're due to have their training, there aren't enough slots available for them to participate. Mm. Um, so that was my maiden speech yeah. on the floor of the Senate. Uh -huh. And once I did it, uh -huh. I was allowed to speak on any issue that uh -huh. came before the body. Uh, okay. Interesting tradition. Yes. Interesting choice. Well, you know yeah. what's so interesting is that that Senate itself is so historical to be in that space. Mm. 
it's um, it's really exciting when we're mm -hmm. able to invite our constituents into the state house. Mm -hmm. Anybody can tour the state house. And we take many residents from Haverhill, from other cities in our district, for a tour. And the Senate is, is pretty awe-inspiring because the history that's happened there, former presidents, and it's the geographical center of Boston mm -hmm. that the Senate, and it's the People's Chamber, mm -hmm. and they're welcome to be in it and to mm -hmm. listen to the debate mm -hmm. when we have formal I'm sessions. Huh. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, all the candidates have received the uh, questions in advance. Any candidate that confirmed, that is, uh, received the questions in advance. And one of the questions, or one of the ways I framed the questions, was around a couple of historical figures that some viewers may not know. One is uh, Elbridge Gary, um, and he got a kind of, um, he got a little smeared a little bit with the, the gerrymandering mm -hmm. sort of thing. He's, it's carried his name forward. And, mm -hmm. and I think that actually includes our region, That's our, right. our area. Mm -hmm. um, but um, he was famous for some other reasons. I don't know if you want to sure. sp speak to mm -hmm. what his positions were mm -hmm. and um, maybe how they represent or don't represent your own point of view. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating because in modern times, <coughs> we live in a world of two political parties, mm -hmm. Democrats and Republicans, mm -hmm. but to really look at the evolution historically of how there was this tension between federalism and... Can I interrupt you right there? Of course you may. Two parties? Two official parties, <laughs> yeah. But with Green Party or the, um, yeah, but I the would, Constitutional Party or... You know, I would say that they exist, but um, for them to be able to gain traction, still super challenging yep. in, in yep. these times um, yep. for, for obvious reasons because of the, the structure of uh, campaign finance, mm -hmm. you know, access to airwaves and things of that nature. It's still mm -hmm. super challenging, mm -hmm. um, you know, whether you're a libertarian, Green Party, um, mm -hmm. whether or not you want to start your own. I mean, you're going to be facing an uphill battle because we yep. have these two formal yep. developed structures right now. Yep. And to look back at a time when you had uh, you know, more of a federalism approach, and then you had more of a Democratic, Republican approach, mm -hmm. like Mr. Jerry. It's fascinating because mm -hmm. you can see the ideals that were in place, mm -hmm. but the overarching goal for someone like him to say, mm -hmm. let's make sure that the central government doesn't overwhelm states. Mm -hmm. And there's another layer as well, because someone mm -hmm. like him, who was open mm -hmm. to economic mm -hmm. Uh, centralization a little bit more than political centralization. Um, we were talking earlier about how the Constitution itself was up for debate and there were many historical figures that felt strongly that they weren't in favor of it until there was a Bill of Rights included. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that we struggle with the tension between state autonomy mm -hmm. and a centralized government to this day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. It's, um, it's something where we experience it as a state legislature mm -hmm. where the municipalities would like their autonomy as well. Mm -hmm. And hmm. Massachusetts is a home rule state mm -hmm. where there is embedded in our government and our philosophy mm -hmm. that municipal rights are very important and mm -hmm. there needs to be a balance there as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that those values from Massachusetts, mm -hmm. from his state, mm -hmm. carry over into our municipal mm -hmm. and state government too. Yeah, I think of the Declaration of Independence and as well as the Bill of Rights with the first ten amendments for people who may not be familiar with freedom of speech, um, freedom of religion, basic freedom of thought, um, trial by jury, mm -hmm. illegal search and seizure, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, the autonomy of the individual in the Ninth Amendment, the autonomy of the state in the Tenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. um, um, and the Declaration of Independence that uh, Thomas Jefferson wrote, who was not, by the way, at the Constitutional Convention. He was over in, in uh, Paris. Um, I think it might have been a different convention if he had been there, mm -hmm. uh, because he was very much into individual liberty, mm -hmm. um, uh, the dignity of the individual, and the uh, right of the individual to pursue their own happiness the way they define their own happiness as long as they're not infringing on somebody else. Mm -hmm. And those he um, uh, put in very explicitly into the Declaration of Independence. And I think Elbridge 
uh, Gary, and there was another woman from that time, Mercy Otis Warren, that I bet a lot of people are not familiar with, mm -hmm. um, because uh, women couldn't vote, they weren't citizens, I mean, th there was, you know, uh, and I was surprised to find out that she she did a whole history of the American Revolution, mm -hmm. three-volume history that Tom Jefferson has in his library. That's right. Yeah. It's a fascinating history where yeah. even though she had no formal education, here is a woman that participated in a critical point in our nation's history, and she personally knew everyone who was involved in, in crafting these mm -hmm. eternal documents mm -hmm. and um, making these decisions that really forge the path of our country. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, uh, it's been documented and the work that she did is accredited to her. Mm -hmm. and Finally. She, she's, an, <laughs> she's another individual who wanted to make sure that the Constitution included these rights contained in the Bill of Rights and mm -hmm. was vocal about it. Mm -hmm. So it's heartening to see that mm -hmm. in that day she had the space to be able to voice an opinion. Yep. Um, at the same time, we had to wait until 1920 mm -hmm. to be able to earn the vote. So mm -hmm. it's surprising, but mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. progress takes yeah. time, I suppose. Yeah. And some people idealize this document. Uh, I'm debating forever on Facebook with people about about the Constitution, and I th and I think, you know, I'll, almost I get the feeling, and I, I don't mean disrespect to it, but I do know what went into the debates, and you know there was a very strong monarchical uh, position in the debates, and there was a very strong um, individual liberty within the mm -hmm. debates, and that the Constitutional Convention far exceeded its mandate uh, from the Articles of Confederation, which was the original Constitution. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be, the mandate was simply an economic one to work on, on trade. Mm -hmm. You know, how were these 13 colonies, these 13 states now, not colonies anymore, states, going to work together around trade mm -hmm. because they had been independent and working independently with Britain and with France and that sort of stuff. So how are we going to work together with with uh, these European uh, countries? Well, that, that and they went way beyond and they, by the time Elbridge Gerry got to the convention, they had already decided to put aside the Articles of Confederation and to s say, okay, we're going to start a whole new constitution. Mm -hmm. The, These the, conventions are risky. It's true. A lot, a lot of work can, uh, can take place. The, the Tenth Amendment, especially, I mean, you could have your own show on because okay. it, it's so interesting to be able to... And the Tenth Amendment is for the viewers? So that um, any powers that are not enumerated to belong to the United States a.k.a. the federal government, mm -hmm. um, anything that wasn't enumerated would fall to the states and the people. Mm -hmm. And to be able to appreciate that emphasis that, mm -hmm. that states have their unique value mm -hmm. as states mm -hmm. to be able to direct the course of their governance is really fascinating to appreciate mm -hmm. as a person that represents mm -hmm. Massachusetts in the state legislature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and I were also discussing earlier how uh, history is not static. It evolves, and it's important to know your history mm -hmm. in terms of how um, previously U.S. senators weren't elected by a popular vote and were elected by their state legislatures. So, Do you want to talk about how that happened uh, a little bit well, and like, what your position is on that? Because it, it's an interesting... Yeah. It's an interesting... Very interesting question, it, 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 mm -hmm. and it met, kind of matches up with the presidential elections as well. You know, the, the, mm -hmm. when we used to have electors mm -hmm. who did the electing of the president, mm -hmm. you know. I, I think there are some, to some parallels bit. where, even though that's a decision that that is previous to to current um, affairs, what is in the public discourse right right now is the popular vote for president, the mm -hmm. electoral college, is mm -hmm. it still relevant to have an electoral college? Well, when it came to the United States Senate, the original Constitution had it in, in the articles that U.S. Senators would be chosen by state legislators. Mm -hmm. And the thinking, to briefly describe it, sure. was to carry forth that idea that it wasn't going to be an overwhelmingly centralized government. The states would still have that connection 
to the federal government because mm -hmm. they would choose who would represent them in the U.S. Senate because the House of Representatives would be elected by the popular vote. Right. So there was that concept of balance there. Right. And, um, and With a limit of one for every 30,000 mm -hmm. people, and now it's one for every 710,000 people? Mm -hmm. And uh, What voice does the individual really have, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and there was a, a campaign for that change and mm -hmm. different debates and different people with their positions on this issue. Which which issue are we talking about? We're talking about the 17th okay, Amendment. Okay, 17th Amendment, which um, is and, what? In the public discourse to be able to change from having the U.S. Senators elected um, by their state legislators to having it become a popular vote. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as a layperson, I could see both sides of the argument if mm -hmm. I put myself in that time frame, mm -hmm. you could see the pluses and minuses on both sides. Mm -hmm. You could see the desire to have states have a voice mm -hmm. in their federal government, mm -hmm. but then you could also see that you wouldn't want to have your U.S. Senators not be accountable to the people, mm -hmm. per se. Mm -hmm. um, I can understand why we evolved in that direction of wanting to have them directly yeah. elected. Yeah. You can see that the concern for um, having a select group of people decide who might represent them in the U.S. Senate. Although those select group of people were freely elected by, by people and very locally. That's I mean, true. like this race here is very local. Mm -hmm. uh, the 14th Essex is very local, you know, which includes Haverhill and mm -hmm. North Andover, Andover, or, or uh, Methuen. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, so that's very, you know, so you're, and then those people then go um, would, and would represent mm -hmm. your position. I don't think um, at that time in the early 1900s anybody would have ever predicted the influence of money on campaigns and elections. I don't think so. No one would have predicted um, television being the main conduit by which you communicate to the public, TV and radio. And I think that now we have to decide how to solve those problems so that we can get back to a point where the intent behind the Declaration of Independence can be carried forth. And where are you here going? We are. This, I'm, I think I know where you're going with this, but I want to hear where you're going with when you talk about mm -hmm. the conduits of information being TV mm -hmm. um, outside of this regal environment, which is completely free press. Uh -huh. <laughs> it actually is a real free press. There is no. Uh, uh, Anybody can volunteer and do a program at local cable access TV. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we're, so. we're living in strange times where yes. the United States Supreme Court has said that corporations are people. And because of that decision, we would now have to go through great lengths to um, amend the Constitution to change that. And um, it's very bleak because when you talk to the regular person, doesn't matter what political party, they are inclined, the vast majority of people, to say corporations aren't people. People mm. are people. And for corporations to be deemed to have the same rights that residents have is shocking. Freedom of speech for a corporation. Mm -hmm. um, Freedom not to speak? That's true. As it, in the GMO? It's, absolutely. There are many instances where um, the financial resources that a corporation would have inevitably dwarf what a, a regular person would have. So time and time again, in terms of who has a voice, your average person is not going to be able to compete with the corporation. And there are a lot of movements in all of the states, not just Massachusetts, mm -hmm. to try to rectify this. Mm -hmm. And um, it needs to be rectified because mm -hmm. if we continue down a path where we're not actually having campaign finance reform, mm -hmm. but it's getting worse, mm -hmm. where there's unaccountable anonymous money able to influence who represents us in a democracy, well then it's a compromised hundreds, democracy. Hundreds of millions of dollars come in for mm -hmm. governor races from, from out of state mm -hmm. of, in, into congressional races or state uh, uh, senator, or senator races. Mm -hmm. um, and there it used to be a law in some states that to accept money from a corporation uh, would be considered bribery mm -hmm. and it would be punishable. Mm 
uh, as bribery. Now we have lobbying. What are we spending, like $3 billion a year with lobbying mm -hmm. in, in, at the federal government? Mm -hmm. And we spent $3 billion in the presidential election? Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how does the... How does the average person enter into that kind of race? You were talking about how difficult it is to have a multi-party system at the local level, mm -hmm. you know, to run for office, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that it's basically become a two-party system. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much diversity uh, of voice in, in the United States is really represented mm -hmm. if you have, you know, these... Ed, these uh, two parties that have huge amounts of corporate funding. Mm -hmm. I think that um, for the time being, because of the, the more or less two-party system, there is a spectrum within those parties because of the lack of alternatives, so that has evolved. But not only are we dealing with the influence of money in politics that doesn't represent the voice of individual people, there's the parallel issue of the fact that because so much money is required to become elected, it's a huge distraction where we want our elected representatives focusing on the complexities of policy, mm -hmm. the complexity of budget decisions, mm -hmm. helping residents in the district, and it's absolutely unsustainable for them to be distracted with having to fund campaigns just to maintain their roles. Um, I think that we're, we're going down a path that's bleaker than it was even a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I think of like TV and the, the TV stations all got, in 1996, got bought out by six major corporations. Mm -hmm. um, so 95% of, of all TV is now, um, Conan O'Brien does this really funny thing, I don't know if you've ever seen it, where the, 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 uh, uh, the news readers, they're not reporters, news mm -hmm. readers, and they're getting their, um, they're getting their uh, uh, ticker tape, if you will, mm -hmm. from the Associated Press, which comes out of Rockefeller Center, mm -hmm. um, and he, he shows like 20 different news readers from all over the country, and they're reading the exact same script. Mm -hmm. And these are local news stations mm -hmm. reading the exact same story, word for word. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, the fourth estate has its own challenges. Yes, because, it does. You know, yes. fourth estate is the press. Okay. You know, we need the ability to communicate um, with each other, and there's been massive consolidation of media outlets mm -hmm. over the past 25 years, and you know, people are seeking alternatives online. Mm -hmm. and things of that nature. Yep. Um, but, um, you know, we have to respond with all of these developments, campaign finance challenges, mm -hmm. media, the Internet. Mm -hmm. um, how do these impact the democratic process uh -huh. and having representation of regular people? Well, we're wrapped up, wrapping up already. It was, this mm. half hour went fast. It I sure wish did. we could uh, continue these topics for, mm -hmm. well, you know, good luck in your candidacy, and um, hopefully you can come back, and and I'll send you a bunch of new questions, and we can uh, continue our discussion. Okay. And thank you for joining us on Perspectives. Again, my name's Dan McGraw. My guest today was Kathleen Ives O'Connor, the incumbent for First Essex State Senate.